clients. We don't, you know, describe them as students because they, they don't go to classes as initially. The NEDB client is assigned to an assessor, a certified assessor who has met, met CASA's requirements. Uh, they work with these assessors to um, complete all the tasks, uh, the competencies that CASA's are already determined as equivalent to high school level skills. So these competencies are actually um, embedded. They are hidden in some performance task, task areas that are available on, on, on the CASA's NEDP system. So the uh, assessor opens up these competency areas for, for clients. There are requirements about how many competencies areas could be opened at one point and how, you know, because you don't want them to have so many tasks to complete at the same time. So most of the work is done, you know, uh, wherever the individual has access to a computer. It could be a home, it could be at the library, anywhere at all. But then they also need to come in, in the past, pre-COVID-19, they needed to come in um, in person to see the assessor to sort of demonstrate certain competencies as well to ensure that the work they did on their own at home was actually done by them. Because you, you know how online, um, um, instruction, you know, is, is actually completed. So, but now maybe I would kind of mention, touch on that later on, that they're now able to do this remotely. So they also, they complete, uh, complete all these assessments and also the individualized competency area that they have selected in the diagnostic phase. There's also the postdoc assessment because NEDP, um, the NEDP program is not a pass or fail program where you are given an assignment let's say to create a graph, you know, because that's actually one of the things that they need to do. They give us an, uh, some data and they ask them to put it in an Excel graph, for instance. Let's say for whatever reason, certain elements are missing from the graph that you, maybe you didn't label the graph, you know, the assessor marks that as incomplete, but you haven't failed, but the assessor gives you some feedback regarding that. And you have that opportunity during post as assessment to redo to kind of work on that competency area to ensure that you have 100% accuracy because that's the goal of NEDP. Each competency that the learner actually demonstrates that they work on, they have to master each competency at 100% accuracy. If they're writing a resume, for instance, all the elements that CASAS has identified that need, would need to be in that resume would need to be there before the assessor is able to mark that competency as fully demonstrated. So they have that opportunity there during post-tax assessment. It doesn't matter how many times they do that. And that's one of the reasons that there is no uh, time limit. So there's also the portfolio review that, um, that has to be done. When the, the client is actually working on all those competency areas, they're developing a portfolio. The portfolio is, um, kind of the kind of the compilation of their work essentially that the portfolio is reviewed by an independent assessor who the client didn't work with at the beginning and that's one of the reasons that CASAS um, in the past mandated that you should have at least three um, NEDP staff members at your location but now you need to have at least two a minimum of two or five is recommended depending on the size of your program so there has to be that independent reviewer who actually overlooks the work of your assessor to ensure that at least there's an input from somebody else. So, and then after every, all the uh, competencies have been demonstrated, I think about 70 or so of them, and then the um, individual is recommended to the Maryland Department of Labor for the high school diploma. Next slide, please. So uh, I think I alluded to some of the staff roles uh, when I was talking about the program design. The program administrator, which I think almost everybody on this uh, platform is a program administrator. You have um, complete oversight of the NADP program. You oversee the program in its entirety. So, but you do have the, our pro most of our program administrators are not NADP. They're not uh, certified NADP staff. You know, they're not advisors and assessors, but, but you do have to have at least two advisors and assessors. The ad advisor, is the first point of contact essentially. I, I know on paper that's what it is, but for most of our programs is actually the intake and assessment specialist because they have, they've taken on um, an important role in bringing the NEDP learner on board. So, but essentially in terms of the 
uh, program itself, the advisor is the first NEDP staff that the clients will be working with. The um, advisor administers the diagnostic test that the client has to take and also interprets the results. It also provides feedback for the client. You know, if the client, a lot of our NADP clients that come to our doors, they're essentially uh, individuals perhaps have been having, they've been taking the GD test and they're having difficulty with the math. That's the one, this one subject area that a lot of people have difficulty with. It doesn't mean that the NEDP is the, uh, is the right thing for them, but some of them do well in NEDP. So the client, I mean, the advisor gives uh, the feedback that the client needs to be successful. So the assessors, the person that the individual works with during the generalized assessment phase where they, where, um, they actually do the work in the NEDP system. The assessor is trained to give the right appropriate feedback to the client. It's not anything like you failed there's no pass or fail, you know, they, they're kind of, it's just like the teacher giving feedback to the student. There are certain things the teacher couldn't put on the report card. So the same thing with the um, NEDP assessor. So the assessor evaluates all the tasks and provide client feedback. The portfolio review I've already alluded to that is that independent set of eyes taking a look at the work of the client. Next slide, please. So I, I don't, I, I know this is not about performance, um, NEDP performance, but I don't know how I could talk about NEDP without kind of talking about where we came from. Uh, Maryland, and I really like this data because it shows that Maryland is a leader right there. Uh, California is not included here. I guess I obtained this data from CASAS. Um, they excluded California because they didn't want California um, to kind of skew this data. It's a huge, you know, um, um, I wanted to say country. <laughs> It's a huge state, it would have skewed the data. So, but if you see from uh, NFY14, New York was the only uh, NADP jurisdiction actually with the, um, that was kind of above Maryland in terms of diploma outcomes. It was about 315. Um, no, um, New York had 329, I can see clearly, and Maryland had uh, 315. But from FY, 15 through 17, Maryland took the lead right there, minus the state of California right there. Maryland produced the most diploma. This is according to CASAS. Um, but something happened in F between FY17 and 18 where we kind of fell sharply um, to the third, I think we were third in the, you know, excluding uh, California again, we produced the, we were the third um, state uh, producing the, should I say, the highest number of diplomas right there. But I don't, I like to keep this in view because I, I didn't include FY19 here for obvious reasons uh, because we didn't, it kind of stabilized right there. We had 145 diplomas in FY18 um, and we repeated the same thing in FY19, but I, I don't really want that to be the new norm really. And I, of course, we're not talking about FY20 and I don't know about FY21 either, but it's still good to know where we came from. Next slide, please. Here, I, I won't dwell on this. This just shows a historical uh, data in terms of enrollment versus graduation. You see the slight decline right there. Um, we went up somewhere there in FY16, and then we started going down. Um, and then in terms of enrollment, the same story um, with um, diploma attainment. We went up in FY17, and then we, we, came, we started sort of declining. And in FY19, we stabilized. Next slide, please. Um, program requirements. I just need to rush through my slides now. Um, program requirements. I wanted to point this out because I said, uh, mentioned up front that um, NEDP is proprietary to CASAS. They call the shots essentially because they own the program. So they, the, all the CASAS requirements are embodied in the Maryland Policy and Procedure Manual, which all of our local programs have. And for uh, the Howard County Library, I'll be working with you um, to connect with Case Awikasas uh, to bring you up to date. And also uh, the NEDP policy memorandum, they send this out if there's a new development, they send this out every now and then to kind of um, provide, info. that's one of the ways that they communicate with us. And also there's the yearly statistical report, which is one of the reports that all, our, all of our local providers need to 
send that information to CASAS at the end of each program year. And also because the state of Maryland is partnering with CASAS to provide NEDP to Maryland residents, we also have our certain our requirements. But by no means, we do not contract with CASAS in any way, but our requirements could be more stringent than what CASAS offers, but not anything below what, they, what they're asking us to do. So we have our NEDP assurances, which all of our prov providers must have signed with their application. So I would encourage you to become intimate, you know, to become familiar with the NEDP assurances. And if there are any changes at all, we do update the assurances. So we also have the NEDP budget because NEDP is federally and state funded. The federal budget is different from the state budget. So, but they are subject to the fund limitations under WIOA. Everything that applies to your literacy works and now also applies to NEDP. The only difference is that NEDP funding, both federal and state, must only be used for NEDP services. You could not, you must not use NEDP funds um, to provide services for an ABE program, for instance. Okay. So um, you also have. Sorry. Please could you go back to the last, the previous slide? Great. So you also have professional development requirements that. It's the same thing with the ABE programs. They're required to have 10 hours of professional development. So I've mentioned the, the reporting. NEDP, um, during your quarterly reporting that, you, um, that you're supposed to submit to the state, you're supposed to provide information about your progress, um, you know, about your out outcomes to the state. And also there's the financial reporting. Next slide, please. So CASAS identifies certain hallmarks of a successful program. And I was kind of listening to Ellen's presentation in the morning where she was talking about um, uh, responsibilities. I, I thought about that. I said, you know, I was thinking that the five, um, five, some of the five hallmarks that uh, CASAS identified kind of her presentation of the items that she touched on kind of align with this. So you have to think about your staffing. And I think we mentioned that there are certain staffing requirements. Think about it. Think about it. Who's do you have any staff that is responsible actually for promoting awareness about NEDP? How much information do other staff or your uh, non-NEDP staff know about, about NEDP? Because that's one of the challenges once we bring clients in. If our um, non-NEDP staff, they, if they're not very familiar with NEDP, they're only thinking GED. They're not sort of actively promoting NEDP as well, you know, as well. So it's very important uh, for, for that to, to be in place. And also you need connection to remediation, even though uh, it's CASAS requirements that uh, advisors and assessors should not be providing remediation. They, um, there are certain requirements about the type of feedback that they can give to our clients, but you need to be able to refer your clients to appropriate, um, rem for appropriate remediation. Either at the library or you know wherever they need to to receive because sometimes they are demonstrate they are working on these competency areas and they are stuck so you know they need that assistance so you need strong connections to referrals and um, and I think I, I mentioned that you need to know all the resources that are available so it's very important um, for you to be able to devote some resources some time essentially you know to promote awareness of NEDP because we need this to develop a strong pipeline. The state has this, uh, we have a, a brochure and I have a picture of the brochure there that we can, we always revise this brochure once um, the need arises. So I would encourage you also to have a brochure that you use, you know, to promote NEDP awareness. And then how do you conduct fo staff follow, I mean, client follow up? I was looking at the data before this presentation about how many clients actually exit the program before, um, during the first fiscal year, more than 50% of the clients in both the diagnostic and the generalized assessment phase, more than 50, in certain instances, more than 80% would actually exit before the end of the fiscal year. So you need to kind of know why those clients are exiting and what can be done to, you know, provide the support that they need and then building partnerships as well. Next slide, please. Right, I, I alluded to um, a policy memorandum as one of the ways that CASAS communicates with the field, uh, with the NEDP jurisdictions. And I wanted to briefly point out the two updates that, um, I, that, I made, that are shown here. The remote in-office check has been activated. I think all of our current 
should I say current, because we're still in FY20. Um, are any DP providers are aware of um, the remote in-office check uh, process? It's been, CASA has been working on this for a while, but so it's now been activated and they're training advisors and assessors uh, to be able to use this. So also, I wanted to um, also kind of remind you of the fact that CASAS has decided to uh, reduce, to lower the court score for the, um, for, the math, for the math goals. In the past, up until now, it was 2.30 for a client to be able to begin generalized assessment. It has been reduced from 2.30 to 2.25. So next slide, please. So it's also important for us to, um, for you, as I indicated, indicated earlier, to be aware of the resources that you have available. The NEDP news is the bulletin that CASA sends out every month. Um, I think this was the April bulletin. And also they pro provide important information via that uh, medium, media. And also the NEDP, NEDP professionals, which you all have access to by being an NEDP administrator. Um, because you are the primary contact person and also the CASAS website. And actually you can get to the NED professionals page through uh, CASAS website. Oh. Next slide, please. I think I'm done there. I was hoping to be able to finish on time in case there are any questions for me. But if there are no questions, you have my email, you can always email me. But if there are any questions, please. Um, I'll be happy yeah, to thanks, Saya. We do yeah. have a couple of questions. Okay. Um, so let's see. So a question from Emma. Um, other than the assessor and the advisor and the assessors, providers should also hire a portfolio reviewer. That's the question. Um, the uh, an advisor and assessor is also can also serve as a portfolio reviewer. In the past. The, the CASAS does not really encourage a role differentiation. It's just that they're looking at it from the point of view of one client. One assessor can serve as an advisor, can serve as an assessor, and as a portfolio reviewer to different clients, if you know what I mean. So it's, there's no role differentiation there. Once you're certified, you're certified to do the entire thing, even though there are procedures in terms of if somebody's just go undergoing the training to be an assessor, there are certain, you st your work still needs to be um, monitored by an experienced assessor. But to answer your question, the same staff member who is certified can perform the, the same role for different clients. Okay. Does that clear that up, Emma? Okay, and while we're waiting to hear from you, um, Dawn is asking about tutoring costs. So she says, will we continue to be able to allow students who are within a reasonable score uh, to use NEDP funding to tutor those students? That's a good question. I think um, that's a good question. I think in, in certain instances, perhaps that has been allowed because when you think about it, NEDP fund at the, uh, funding the, at the federal and the state level um, should only be devoted to NEDP clients. Anything that we can do at all to help, to promote learner success. And sometimes we reveal this, if it's not clearly written in the, in the fund use, we cannot work with the ad ad administrator essentially to kind of look at their budget, to see how they can um, align the budget to meet program needs. If you have any specific question about how you can do that, how, whether you need to continue to do that. I think it's something that we need to discuss with you on an individual basis. Okay, thanks, Bio. And another question from Melanie, she's asking, um, you mentioned that the IAS can be the advisor. Does that mean the IAS must be trained as an advisor assessor to fulfill that role? Oh, I'm sorry, I, that was not my intention. What I, what I meant to say there was that the intake and assessment specialist is actually doing some of the work of the advisor in that they are administering diagnose, CASAS diagnostic tests. Because when our NEDP clients come in, they come in with everybody else. Sometimes they're not even aware. Sometimes when they come in, they weren't even aware of NEDP. So at, the, at that point, at the time that they're taking their test, their CASAS diagnostic test, they're not even aware that they were gonna be, they're gonna participate in an NEDP program. So I wasn't saying that the IAS should perform the role of an advisor. I was just saying that 
the IAS sometimes assists, um, you know, with the LEDP, with LEDP programming because they administer assessments, you know, that is also, the assessments are also used to, you know, for the intake, uh, NADP intake process. That's, that, that's what I meant to say. So the IAS might be the initial point of contact for Concept. the NADP students. That's correct. All right. Well, thank you so much, Bio. You really are the perfect liaison between our state office and the National External Diploma Program. It is a program with rules and regulations uh, that, that we must adhere to. Um, but it is a great option for our learners who are seeking a Maryland High School Diploma. So thank you so much, Bio, for that information. Thank you uh, to the 25 of you who are still here at 1230 and have been active participants since nine o'clock. So thank you so much for your time today. Um, we will adjourn for today and meet back here on Wednesday. Wednesday, we have uh, data and assessment is our first nine o'clock session. At 1045, we'll be talking about um, instructional topics. And then the final session, 12 to 1230, will be about IELCE, IET. So thank you so much for your attention today. I hope you have a wonderful day. Get out there, enjoy the sun, and enjoy the beginning of June. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Ellen. Thanks.